The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Lit. Comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday Study featuring Chairman Omali Eshetela. My name is Akile Anayi, Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Today's study comes from the political report to the APSP's 7th Congress, Vanguard, the Advanced Detachment of the African Revolution, Chapter 4, titled The Deepening Crisis of Imperialism, The Tipping Point of the Uneasy Equilibrium. We will be reviewing the second half of this chapter starting on page 128. This political report serves as a means to define the events we see happening in the world and how it is we've gotten to this point through the lens of our party's theory, African internationalism. It provides the sharpest analysis of imperialism in crisis and lays out what it will take to deepen it for the benefit of our revolution. While it may be easy to get swept up by the events we see unfolding as a consequence of this crisis, being pushed and pulled in every direction besides that which leads to the revolution, this chapter helps us to understand all freedom-loving people, all people that want to see an end to this parasitic social system born from the enslavement of African and Africa and African people, that imperialism in crisis should be deepened through our efforts. We must engage in the struggle for the freedom of Africa and our people, which will free every human being on the planet. We must all do our part in shaping the free world. We must all strike a blow to imperialist white power. The analysis offered by African internationalism gives us the confidence and the way forward to liberating our Africa, destroying imperialism forever. I am deeply honored to introduce the leader and founder of the African People's Socialist Party, the author of Vanguard, leader of the entire free world, which will come as a consequence of the work he's committed to our struggle for the past 50 years. Please help me in welcoming Chairman Omali Eshetela. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrades. Uhuru. Uh, first of all, I really want to uh, thank Director Akile Anai for uh, the introduction and to express my appreciation to everyone who's come uh, to this session of Amali Taught Me, uh, something that we do every Sunday morning here. And just to remind everybody that uh, this is being done uh, not for the purpose of, of getting likes and things like that uh, on social media, but this is a part of the process that was established by uh, our party, the African People's Socialist Party, uh, a few years ago to really uh, deepen uh, the political uh, and ideological uh, development of, first of all, members of the department of the African People's Socialist Party that's responsible for the political education, 
of our entire organization, our entire movement, and also for the production and distribution of ideas uh, throughout uh, the world, uh, beyond our party, beyond our movement. And that's practically what it's about. It's, it's grown to uh, envelop uh, people uh, in general uh, who uh, are at attempting uh, to advance uh, your understanding. And it's important to say that this is for the purpose of, of making a revolution, that we have a responsibility of changing the circumstances that we live in. And while people, many people spend a lot of time on social media, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and whatever other platforms are available, uh, in general, the African People's Socialist Party is the only formation that I'm familiar with uh, that does it for the purpose of equipping ourselves to take on the work that we have to do uh, to take power. Our objective is not to simply uh, be observers, uh, watching things happen in the world and commenting on them, but our objective is to uh, move uh, in a fashion, in an informed fashion, uh, to be able to take power over our own lives. We accept the responsibility ourselves. We, we struggle and support uh, the people, struggle with and support uh, the people of Venezuela. Uh, we struggle with and support uh, the people, peoples in the Middle East and uh, other places around the world. But we recognize uh, that all of the solidarity and support that we offer them uh, in words and in deeds, uh, do not uh, substitute and cannot substitute for our own responsibility. Uh, they are not going to free us. We're not going to be free by, freed by, uh, by the Venezuelan uh, revolution. Should it unfold, uh, as it unfolds, uh, what's going to free us is what we do right here uh, in the places where we are located. And I say right here because uh, the African People's Socialist Party is located in various places around the world, and we have assumed the responsibility in all those places uh, to contribute to the total liberation of Africa, uh, the total liberation and unification of Africa and African people around the world. So it's not something simply to be discussed, uh, to be talked about, to be admired, to be applauded. Uh, it's something to do. And uh, that's who we are, and that's what we do. And today, uh, we are talking again uh, from chapter four, of the political report that was made to the African People's Socialist Party in October of last year. And uh, we do uh, these, con uh, it was made at our Congress in October of last year. And our Congress is uh, happening right now every five years. And the Congress uh, offers us an opportunity first to turn the party, the leadership of the party, for the duration of the Congress over to the membership of the party. This is the time where uh, the Congress, the uh, highest uh, uh, leadership in the entire uh, party structure, which is the membership, actually uh, has responsibility for leading the party for this process. This is where we uh, sum up, we look at what's happening in the world, we look up, we sum up uh, how we uh, made decisions at our last Congress and where we are in relationship uh, to that, what, what successes and failures we've had. We sum up uh, to see uh, where we are uh, as it uh, relates to uh, our accuracy in uh, having uh, said this is uh, where we are, this is what we have to do, how accurate were we, what, what adjustments have to be made. We sum up uh, uh, and we have elections of the main uh, leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. And uh, this is the members who do this, the members who make a determination of whether they can unite with the political report that sums up what we've done uh, in the last period, that sums up uh, and provides a political uh, and, uh, and ideological uh, uh, explanation for our reality uh, by which we measure uh, the success that, that guides all of the work that we do. Uh, and the membership uh, is, uh, has an opportunity to participate. And even before the Congress, the members of our party will have discussed this political report for three or four months prior to that. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to come to the Congress well-armed with an understanding of what is coming from uh, the leadership of the party as certainly as uh, expressed in the political report that I have a responsibility of writing and delivering. Uh, so it's a, it's a big thing, and we require 
uh, more than an audience uh, from uh, people who are in the party. We require leaders. We require uh, the members of the party to participate in shaping and deciding uh, uh, where, where it is that we're trying to go. And the members vote on this political report and say, yeah, I, I agree with it, or these changes need to be made, or we disagree. And if the Congress offers us a, an opportunity uh, to struggle around these questions and to elect our leaders. Uh, and then this is the, the, the democracy of, of the democratic centralist uh, process, or this is an expression, the highest expression of the democracy and the democratic centralist process of, uh, of, uh, of that constitutes uh, our, our work, our party, our life uh, as a political organization. And then following this Congress, where the people have voted on the leaders, where the members have voted on the political report, well, we've passed resolutions saying this is how we're going to approach uh, these specific questions and, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and then the responsibility of the work uh, falls on the shoulders of the Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party. And the Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party now has been given the authority by the membership of the party. They've been given the democratic authority by the membership of the uh, party to require the, that uh, the members of the party uh, carry out uh, the determinations that were made uh, uh, at our Congress. And this is what's called democratic centralism. Now the centralized leadership uh, for what happens, <laughs> uh, it's been bestowed on me. It's been bestowed on the Central Committee. It's been bestowed uh, on the political uh, 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 bureau of the uh, of the African People's Socialist Party by the members. And then our leadership, I and the Central Committee, uh, can be uh, 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 guaranteed uh, more or less that uh, we have the authority uh, to determine and demand uh, the kind of discipline uh, to carry out uh, the, the work, the program, the resolutions, the mandates, uh, uh, that came uh, from the general membership of the Congress. You have bestowed this on us, and now it's our responsibility to make sure it happens. And making sure it happens means that uh, the membership of the party can be called upon, uh, can be required by the leadership of the party uh, to carry out the determinations that's made by the membership of the party uh, at the Congress. So that's what this political report is all about. We've summed it up. We struggle around these questions. What we're talking about now is something that we talked about at least for at least three or four months prior to the Congress. And then the Congress, we reviewed it again. And we keep doing that. And the reason we keep doing it, because we keep reminding ourselves, and we keep learning in this process. I learned, you learned in the process uh, uh, what exactly what it means. Uh, because uh, re life, uh, reality, uh, influences our understanding and how uh, the mandates and resolutions that we pass should be carried out. So unless. Sunday, we discussed, um, we began the discussion uh, on uh, chapter four of the political report to this Congress that has the title, The Deepening Crisis of Imperialism. Uh, because we are now uh, at a time where people are being excited and exorcised, uh, so to speak, by uh, what, what uh, what uh, we see happening in the world. The, the United States government, which is a criminal enterprise, I, well, you can't even call it criminal because uh, uh, crime is violation of the law, and they made the laws. So, and uh, the state, the imperialist state, all states uh, legalize themselves, and so they legalize the terror uh, that they're waging against the, the people uh, of, of uh, Venezuela, that they, of the entire region of the Americas, all of the Americas, whether it's in Houston, Texas, or Caracas, uh, uh, in Venezuela, the United States government, uh, it, it legalizes uh, what it's doing, it, it, the murder. And that's what it is, murder, uh, that's being waged uh, in Yemen. Thousands of people are dying as a consequence of the actions and activities of the United States government. And uh, the, the people of Iran are being threatened. Uh, with war and to, to, to some extent even nuclear war. The, the country, the, the world uh, is being jeopardized by the, this crisis where the United States and, and these, uh, these atomic uh, weapons uh, toting uh, forces 
dealing in a very critical and dangerous ways uh, with each other. And the United States is the main perpetrator because it's a, it's a declining empire uh, that sees everything that is stolen, everything uh, the world that uh, requires slaves and slave masses being threatened. And the United States is the, and it has more nuclear weapons, more military uh, forces and, and a greater arsenal than any any force on earth, any force that's ever existed on the planet earth, the United States has it, but it's declining. And it's experiencing decline, and this is part of the crisis. It's not just the United States in the state of the decline, it's a whole social system that, uh, that uh, was uh, founded in Europe, that was uh, consolidated in Europe, and particularly in what they like to refer to as Western Europe. Uh, uh, and this system is in crisis, and you can see all around the world the so-called uh, European Union, the, uh, the Brexit, what's happening in England pulling out and how England is in a state of total disarray politically, total disarray. Uh, you might not be able to easily interpret that from CNN uh, or CIANN or you might not be able uh, to get uh, you know, uh, absolute clarity from looking at the, uh, these uh, war uh, information uh, entities, productions, uh, that calls itself media in this country, uh, but it's in total chaos. Uh, Italy, uh, France, uh, England, uh, Portugal, uh, uh, Belgium, which is the headquarters of the European Union and the so-called European Parliament. All of these places are in a state of crisis. And you look at, side, at the United States, and what's uh, obvious to some of us is that uh, that the economy is not what they say it is. That one reason they can claim to have uh, such a low unemployment rate is because many of the people who would be counted uh, as unemployed uh, if they uh, were around are uh, in prison. And you've got uh, a couple of million people in prison. And so they're not on the rolls. They're not even counted. They're not counted as being unemployed. They're not even factored in, and, and they can say that the, the, uh, the unemployment rate is so low uh, because uh, so many people have uh, opted out of even going to uh, uh, these employment uh, centers to apply for work. And uh, they aren't counted after a certain period of time. If, you ha if they haven't shown up uh, to these agencies to try and get work, they're not accounted as being uh, part of the unemployment rolls. <laughs> <coughs> and another reason <coughs> that <coughs> is <coughs> excuse me, comrades. <coughs> another reason that they can <coughs> brag about a low unemployment rate <coughs> is because many of the people who are employed are holding two and three jobs because they, their pay is so low. At the same time, trillions of dollars are being pumped <clears throat> into the coffers of these, uh, of these uh, major corporations. Uh, they just sit, this money is just sitting there, more or less. Conceptually, the money is sitting there. And uh, so the crisis uh, is happening. The crisis is something that has allowed uh, middle class, normal, uh, I say middle class, but uh, uh, upper working class, normal uh, middle class and upper working class white people uh, give, are given an opportunity to go and mine our communities on a regular basis. And America is great. You can just ride uh, in these communities in your pickup truck with clipboards and what have you. You can see uh, cheap properties, housing available in places where white people never would have lived in the past. But when the economy gets bad in one sector, then you can always go into the African community and find cheap housing where Africans are being pushed out of our communities. And then these nice white people with no enmity, generally speaking, they don't dislike black people. They just love the opportunity that they have to go over here, get this cheap property, much cheaper than any place that they live as white people, buy it, flip it over, make money. Their children can be offered a, a, a likelihood of college education and things like that. This is a major crisis. And course, what happens, of course, they push the African community out. Uh, and Africa is being gentrified, e gentrified, even as we have this discussion now. More and more white people, cheap property. Uh, Chinese, cheap property. Africans are, are being pushed out of our communities, our villages, and things like that. You, 
this is what's happening in the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's riven. The whole world is riven with profound contradictions where well, for some of us, the only way out is revolution. And some of us have responsibility to get to the core of the question as opposed to simply looking at symptoms. And to go beyond uh, just this uh, need, uh, especially that you will find uh, in the United States where people uh, play at revolution and they uh, characterize as revolutionaries because they can uh, block an interstate most times and nowadays uh, even with the assistance or support uh, of, the, of, the, of the federal troops, of state troopers and, and, and local uh, so-called uh, uh, law enforcement organizations, uh, and it, it, which serves as a kind of uh, pressure relief valve uh, to take the pressure off because there's evidence something is happening. And what's happening, of course, is most of this uh, does not even uh, require the support of masses of people. It's, they, we have now professional protesters who protest on a regular basis, that's what they do. And they protest outside of the context of our reality, what's killing and destroying African people. If you want to really make uh, something happen in the best interests of the people in Venezuela as it relates to the United States, you open up a front in the, in the United States. Make the United States have to fight here. Uh, build a revolutionary organization among the masses of African working class here. But that's with the African people socialist party, that's what we do. And that's what we do in Everywhere we are located, uh, and I say here, I mean every place we are located, that's what we do. We, uh, uh, our objective is not to upset the United States or anything like that. Our objective is to take total uh, uh, liberation and unification of Africa and African people around the world. So now what we want to look at, we're talking about the, the, the second uh, part of a discussion uh, on the crisis, the deepening crisis of imperialism from uh, from Vanguard, the uh, political report to the Seventh Congress. And what we've uh, talked about for up to now is trying to help people understand what it is that you're looking at. Because there are people who want to define the contradiction in the United States uh, and the primary contradiction in the world are people who want to define that by, by uh, looking at and describing what uh, the existing current president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, is doing. And so uh, for many people, being opposed to Trump uh, is sufficient. You, you're, really, <laughs> you're really radical. Uh, look what this person just said about Trump, you know, uh, or Trump's policies, et cetera. And uh, that's not uh, getting to the essence of it. In fact, that's what's been happening for the last several years. And many times in the 1960s, we saw a revolutionary movement sweeping the planet Earth. And uh, people wanted to overturn the entire system, overturn the whole relationship that white power imperialism has to the rest of the world. And what has happened uh, is that in a, a, a few pockets, uh, you saw this kind of revolutionary movement uh, achieve some element of success. Uh, even in Vietnam, um, a magnificent revolutionary movement, the most heroic people uh, that we've seen express uh, uh, themselves uh, through an attempt to uh, to solve the problems of the people and of the future in a long period of time. This amazing revolutionary movement, uh, but the outcome was not overturning the whole system. And so, uh, and as much as they wanted to, because it's a global system. It's not a, it wasn't a Vietnamese system. Uh, it was a system that came into existence uh, in Vietnam, uh, throughout uh, Asia, throughout the Americas, what they refer to as the Americas, Africa, et cetera, with the accent of, uh, of, of, of capitalism born from this imperial enterprise where Europe went out and began to steal resources, steal human beings and what have you, and, the, and, and out of this grew this, this thing that we know uh, as capitalism uh, that has a death grip uh, on all of humanity that's being weakened by the efforts of the people, uh, and our responsibility is to, uh, has been to sum that up and to create the organization, to create the ideological direction that breaks us out of this thing and overturn the whole system, not just Trump, because to simply be opposed to Trump means to be for Democratic Party and to be enthralled by the latest uh, militant in the Democratic Party, to be enthralled by suddenly a Democratic Party has discovered reparations, right? Uh, has discovered socialism, right? And so those of us who've been 
involved in the struggle for long periods of time know that the only reason they're talking about socialism and reparations today is because after doing everything they could to crush anything that looked like socialism, to destroy any discussion that might suggest reparations, they, this fail. And the concepts of the, the idea of socialism are certainly the recognition that capitalism doesn't work and socialism, of course, is the only option other than capitalism uh, to see uh, that they've been unable to stop uh, this growing clamor by Africans and other people around the world for the taking back our resources upon which the entire uh, capitalist system rests. Uh, this is why they are attempting to get in front of it and take it someplace else. So they'll give you some welfare socialism and some welfare reparations uh, if you allow them. And we're saying the hell with that, the whole system has to go. That there's nothing you can do to satisfy the aspirations of African people for liberation. Uh, there's nothing you can do. You can't purchase our support uh, for a social system that's murdering people around the world, even if it were possible for America to grant some kind of um, uh, Ursat's freedom uh, for African people in the United States, then uh, we would never be willingly a part of a social system that would buy some solidarity and unity with us uh, by, at the expense of everybody else on the planet Earth, even if it were possible. That's opportunism. That's what you see uh, with some sectors who uh, will take uh, the right to join the military. Uh, uh, now you can be a homosexual and you can drop bombs. Uh, you can be a woman, you can drop bombs on people uh, in Yemen or people, uh, oppressed peoples around the world. You can now become officers uh, in, the, in the domestic uh, milit colonial military forces that they call the police. Now you can rise to the top of the ranks and uh, oppressing your people. You're like the, the, the you're like the, this, uh, caricature of the indigenous uh, 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 scouts uh, who uh, will take the white man to uh, where the indigenous people uh, you know, are located and knows the habits and, of the indigenous people and are better than the white man, so you become the scout. You can be the one who can betray your people most efficiently, and that's what they offer African people and have done it for the longest period of time, and that's been, been a part of their success, but we are against that. So I just want to say, we're talking about something bigger than Trump. We're talking about uh, something that came into existence with the existence uh, of, uh, of uh, inner society. And this has been specific particularly to Europe. I'm not, I'm not saying uh, that something of some sort of some uh, uh, similarity did not exist any other place, but in particularly in Europe, uh, where you saw the um, emergence of private ownership of the land. Uh, and uh, you, which is the producer of all value. Value comes from the land, no matter what kind of social system, or whether it's, uh, even if you're a farmer or, uh, or something, I say even if you're a farmer, as though there were, that were a lesser thing that you can be, but the point is that you don't have to be uh, working in a computer uh, joint uh, to uh, be creating value. Value is created uh, by all the people who uh, contribute to their capacity to feed, clothe and house people uh, to reproduce, to produce life, reproduce life. And, and uh, so uh, since the advent of, uh, of uh, uh, the social system uh, that required uh, being able to take for one sector of a, of a, of a society, uh, to take what they need at the expense of a greater sector of society who produce what they need, right? Uh, then you gotta have some means by which you can lock people into this relationship because people won't do it voluntarily. Nobody will be a voluntary slave. So you gotta have the machinery to maintain this relationship. And I say this relationship, I don't mean just to maintain slavery, but to also to maintain the enslaver, to maintain the well-being of those who uh, benefit from slavery. This is a relationship. You don't have a self, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, a self-acting uh, enslavement, you know, like let's go out and enslave ourselves. No, there's some, there's, if you have someone who is enslaved, then you have someone who is an enslaver. If you have the oppressed, there is an oppressor. 
That's a relationship. That's what we call dialectics. That one cannot exist without the other. There's a unity of opposites. You have, you have, you have the oppressed, that's one op thing, and then you have the oppressor. Those are opposites, but you have a unity of opposites. That's what we call dialectics, because one, neither of these can exist without the other. You can't have oppressed without oppressor. You can't have an oppressor without oppressed. So this is the unity of opposite, and this is a relationship. And in order for this relationship to exist, uh, 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 you, can't, you have to have the means by which to, make, to keep the oppressed connected to the oppressor. And this is called the state. This is the, the entity with the big stick. This is, uh, it, it boils down to, uh, today uh, in the form of CIA, FBI, it, um, uh, NATO, military forces, uh, uh, jails, prisons, the courts, all of this is part of it. And then in addition to that, you have to have control of as much as you can win of how people view this relationship. The victims, uh, not just the victims, but the oppressor must also have the belief that this oppressor, this relationship, his relationship, the oppressor's relationship uh, is just and permanent. Um, there's no way in hell uh, for the U.S. government to be killing and murdering people all around the planet Earth. If this entity, this ruling class that's responsible for that, I'm talking about people with big eyeglasses who own Microsoft and uh, the people who people are held up as, as wonder kints uh, because they uh, created uh, uh, Apple uh, from stealing all these resources from Congo and other places uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, these people, in order to stay in power, they have to themselves believe that their rule is just and permanent. Because if they didn't believe it, then they'd be jumping off bridges and stuff like that because they know the murder and mayhem they've caused their misery around the world. So they have to believe it's permanent. It's going to be like this forever. That's why every revolution you've ever read about, every one of them just about uh, the oppressor, is the last person to leave because they really think they're going to be here. You've, revolutions, there have been revolutions where they were having, the oppressors were having balls uh, 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 two or three days before the whole thing collapsed on them because they could not believe that it was over. Uh, that's why you see Vietnam at the last minute, people hopping on helicopters and things like that, trying to get the hell out of uh, Ho Chi Minh City, what was Saigon, uh, before the Vietnamese Revolution, because they have to believe it's permanent. They have to believe that. Increasingly, it's difficult for the oppressor to believe that it's permanent. And this is when you see the crisis really uh, going crazy and things like that, and everything uh, is up for grabs. Every idea is up for grabs. Uh, there's nothing uh, concrete uh, that, uh, that this whole, that the ideas of supremacy uh, is tethered to. When I say supremacy, I'm talking about ruling class supremacy. I'm not in that other place. So anyway, I just wanted to say those things. Uh, and the state is the instrument, the, the military, the, and all of those, even the school system, even the electoral process itself serves the state. Uh, and that's important because uh, people, many people, especially Africans, have uh, uh, you know, become introduced through the civil rights movement primarily in the United States uh, to uh, the electoral process uh, under the leadership of the African petty bourgeoisie that was heavily influenced. Uh, by uh, religion, Christianity, uh, and, and what have you. And uh, so uh, all of the, the death marches that we took uh, in the right uh, to go and register to participate in the bourgeois elections, uh, we did prayers and things before. We did prayers after we had the funerals, and we did all of those wonderful things that is so, uh, there's almost biblical, it's almost uh, uh, a theologically based act to go out and vote. Yeah, you know, because that's how you know, we've come to understand this whole electoral thing. Uh, but it's not biblical. It's a part of a process. And the thing that makes a, a, what we call a bourgeois election is an election that's conducted uh, uh, by the rulers, uh, the ruling class, so uh, significant, it offers a, a, an opportunity for a nonviolent contest. Because the ruling class is not some uh, uh, homogeneous uh, entity. It, doesn't agree on every question. The only thing it agrees on is uh, ruling the world. 
and that this system should dominate the world, and that Africans and Mexicans and uh, indigenous people and oppressed people should be under their thumb, their boot forever. That's the unity that they have. But they have differences in terms of who's going to get what, uh, uh, how it's going to be achieved, uh, difference of opinions of uh, how to control the niggas. Uh, do you go in with a hammer and beat everybody down? Uh, well, on the one hand, and other sectors say, hey, if you do that, then what you do is just make, uh, uh, create uh, more greater evidence to them that the system doesn't work and they will start organizing to overthrow you. So they have these kinds of differences among them. Uh, and so, uh, the elections uh, give them a nonviolent contest among themselves. And they need this process to fight among themselves uh, to, in a nonviolent fashion because they're not fighting over some democratic ideal. They're fighting about how it is that we are going to control this block of capital. This, this sector of the white ruling class is going to control the world going to control its resources, going to continue being able to send our children off to, to, uh, to live forever in mansions. And uh, how are we going to do this? This is what it's all about. How are we going to just keep getting more and more resources? How are we going to dominate the entire world so that it's at our foot, the, the people, uh, our footstools? That's what it's all about. And so, uh, and, and it's all about if, if we're not successful, then it's all over for me. It's all over, for, uh, et cetera. So how do I maintain my status? Uh, and if you watch in anything that's happening, you see more and more U.S. corporations that's been there for a long time. Uh, they are disappearing uh, in terms of the competition existing between uh, the ruling class uh, itself. These different sectors of the ruling, they have, they're merciless. They don't, they don't care about each other in that fashion. They damn sure don't care about you. Uh, no matter what kind of smiles or accents that they have, when they don't care about you, uh, the whole system is owned and controlled by them. And to make sure that it's maintained, they have this electoral, bourgeois electoral process. So that this contest between them for control of the military, control of the police, control of the prisons, control of the CIA, control of the FBI, control of the NSA, all of these other entities, institutions, control over the educational process and system, uh, how that's going to be acquired and maintained. Uh, they have this electoral process that so they don't have to fight. They don't have to put their own armies out in the field to fight each other to do it. They can do it this way. And then the consequences should be, through the electoral process, the, the, the victors, and sometimes there's a combination of victors here uh, uh, in terms of capturing control of the state, the consequence should be then the state becomes an instrument uh, that uh, this uh, uh, sector, uh, this combination of forces from the bourgeoisie uh, can use to control the world uh, to its advantage, even as it relates to contending sectors of the bourgeoisie. They didn't have to pick up a gun. They didn't have to do anything like that. The only guns are being wielded are being wielded by the instruments of the other instruments of the state. Those like the police department who kill us in our communities, who oppress us in our communities. That's like the sheriff's department. That's like every pig that you hate. They're the ones who kill Mike Brown in uh, 2009 uh, is an instrument of this state power that, that uh, may appear to be mysterious to some people, but it's the instrument of this state power to maintain the status quo to maintain the relationship between the slave and the slave master, to maintain the relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor, to maintain the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. That's what it's for. And then they have these pump, these ideas. They have educational institutions, they have movies, they have everything that you see that, that perpetuates this notion, first of all, of the justice, the goodness of the social system that's killing and oppressing you, uh, and then secondly, uh, to uh, perpetuate this idea of, the, of, of how uh, the oppressed uh, should be oppressed, should love being oppressed, uh, and the oppressors uh, should always dominate. And then they solicit as much support and help uh, in this process as they can from masses of people. That's part of what the electoral process is. The bourgeoisie uh, needs to control the world. It needs uh, to be able to go and do anything they have to do uh, to the people in Venezuela, do anything they have to do to people in Yemen and every place around the world. And so they have elections. And then all of these uh, people run for office, including the Obamas uh, and including the Bernie Sanders and all of them. 
Uh, and you may see some expressions of disagreements on some, some points, uh, but all of them unite about maintaining this, this system. So they have an election. And what happens, it gives the people an opportunity to vote on which killer that you really want to have in power. You have a nice killer over here. You have a killer that shows his fangs over here. You have a killer over here that speaks good words. He'll call you Mr. Nigger. Then you have a killer over here that just call you Nasty Nigger. And so you pick Mr. Nigger over Nasty Nigger and all of these, you go vote for that. And that means that you've, what you've done is you've given the oppressor a mass base that the oppressor doesn't have otherwise to carry out this policy of murder and mayhem against the people. That's what happens inside this country. White people vote for the one they like the best because uh, Africans are threats, and we are threats. By the way, I'm not, I'm not glossing over that. Black people, Mexicans, the indigenous people are threats to this, to this order because everything we've got has been stolen from us and then shared with the white people who are here. So you're right to be afraid of us as long as you support the system and a part of it. Because yes, your grandmother, if when she walks past the dark alley, should she have the courage to do so uh, without armed guards that you call the police and the rest of them, somebody's going to hit on the head, take her purse, or do something else. Because that's the way the system is set up. And your grandmama benefits from it. You understand? And you, yes, you're going to have to have this army, this wall of police that separates your community uh, from this community of the oppressed. Because the setup is like that in everything that the oppressed have. Your food, my food is in your refrigerator, and I'm coming for it. I might not even be conscious of what this, how this relationship got started, anything. I just know you got it. And we live in the same society or the same social system. How in the hell should you have everything and I have nothing? Why do your children have a future and my children don't have a future? No, I no longer buy this nonsense about because your children are smarter or because your children are more civilized or something to that effect or because my children uh, listen to rap music or that uh, and, and wear their pants sagging. No, 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 no. I don't buy that stuff anymore. Anyway, I'm going to go to a page. <laughs> Uh, 128. And I hope I haven't exhausted this discussion already. Uh, this always happens when we do this. There's some uh, evil genie out there. That, uh, but I want to read. I'm on page 128. And uh, uh, because uh, the one thing that's happened uh, is, as you know, everybody here knows that uh, the Trump administration has been under assault since its inception by another sector of the bourgeoisie. And uh, this is an internal fight between them for control of the state. It's not over Trump killing people, uh, and overthrow, trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela. You don't even hear them talking about that. They, you might hear them talking about they don't like the way he's going about the killing. You might hear them saying he should have come through the Congress to kill him. They don't condemn the fact that they here they're trying to murder a whole the whole population because they can no longer control them. They're not saying that. Uh, they're not saying that by controlling Yemen because uh, it is a place that critical to them uh, because all that oil goes around the horn of Africa and because it's uh, critical uh, for uh, the petroleum and what have you uh, and for them to maintain hegemony. Uh, over that region so that the, the Saudi reactionary Saudi government uh, and the reactionary uh, uh, Jewish state, uh, both of them created by imperialist white power, the Jewish state and the Saudi regime. Uh, they, the, these entities uh, supported and created in, uh, by the United States and these other forces. And anyway, uh, so, you know, this contest is happening and, and people are you know, uh, think they're really smart because they read the newspapers every day. <laughs> so I'm on page 128, the uh, second full paragraph. It says, as this political report is being written, the Trump regime is under investigation by a special counsel for allegations of collusion with Russia and the 2016 presidential election. There is an obvious attempt by a collaborative bourgeois effort to undermine Trump's ability to govern and to remove him from office if necessary. Some have even suggested involvement by the British MI6 intelligence arm in the exposure of Trump's alleged collusion with Russians, with Russia. And 
this is something that's been playing out since the very beginning, that somehow the Russians are responsible for Trump's election. This is a sector of the bourgeoisie because Trump went into office not using the traditional process through which the bourgeoisie vets whomever it is going to go into power, even if they have different uh, policies and they have different um, candidates that they, uh, different stooges, different toadies uh, that they are putting forward, there's a process through which this happens. And that gi gives uh, some, some uh, sense of uh, security to the whole bourgeoisie that whoever makes it represents the general interest of the bourgeoisie even though there is contention between us, but the general interest of the bourgeoisie is always respected. The, just the status quo, the, the way things work, is all, it's always uh, respected. But Trump didn't go through that, that traditional process. He went outside of that and became an outside candidate, which means that he went to office ostensibly fighting against that setup, which is how he happened to win so many white supporters because he seemed to be against that. And not only did he appear to be it uh, because uh, he was uh, sort of outside of it, he ran against it. He, he when he was doing the base, he said, you can't trust these guys because these guys are paid by the rich. <laughs> his uh, so-called billionaire uh, accusing his opponents of being servants of billionaires because he's carrying his own water. He said, the billionaire's not, he said, I know because I used to pay him. This is what Trump is saying. And uh, he's outlandish uh, and he violates uh, most of the uh, protocols and, uh, the, and, and attacks the relationship that's existed up to now. That's, that's how Trump is functioning. And, uh, and he goes to power. But because he didn't go through the traditional process, he doesn't capture control of the state. He doesn't capture control of the state. He is now the president who formally, who nominally, who constitutionally should control the state. He is the commander in chief, formally. But what you see is that since he's been there, he's had to fight the FBI, which is an arm of the state, the CIA, which is the arm of the state, the other intelligence organizations, which are the arm of the state, all of whom now to try to discredit Trump, Trump is saying that the Russians are involved in his election. So if the Russians are involved in his elections, that means for a sector of the population, there, there's this assumption that he's illegitimate and that the legitimate presidency uh, would be in the hands of somebody else. They don't even just say, they don't even just say the Democratic Party. They say there's some good Republicans who should be in charge, they say. But the problem was Trump was an outlier and he didn't go through the, the process in a normal way, so he's shaking up the system. And there was, uh, uh, and this is an international system. And it's true, if you remember, uh, the, the first uh, statement of Russian collusion, uh, one of the most important things came from a so-called British ex-spy who gave information, who is no longer talked about that much. That's MI6, the international arm of the British government. It is to England what the CIA is to the U.S., it is, uh, uh, there's MI5, which is domestic uh, uh, political police, and MI6, which is the international political police, like in the United States, there's FBI, which is domestic political police, and the CIA, which is the international political police. That's the way it's supposed to work. So uh, there, are, there are daily allegations, uh, some without any legal basis of impropriety by Trump and or uh, those close to him, along with, along with the manner in which Trump waged uh, his campaign. Uh, this serves to tarnish the well-constructed fiction of U.S. governmental high-mindedness and presidential integrity. You see people say, oh, that Trump crazy. That's why you Trump crazy. No, it's not Trump's crazy, uh, but we'll get more. The fact that Trump campaigned as an outsider meant that he had to campaign against the system itself. The system that had disillusioned so many people through the obvious duplicity of traditional politicians. Trump 
uh, campaign against the system that is no longer able uh, to staunch uh, the struggle of the world's peoples whose oppression allows ordinary white colonizers the psychological benefit of whiteness even when the economic benefits are not so obvious. Being white is extremely important. It, the there's a material basis for why it's important. Because white people around the world, everywhere, every nook and cranny, uh, every poor white, rich white community, and I'm not saying there's not a distinction, but I'm saying that it is blurred by the reality that the whole white population rests upon a pedestal, everything of colonial extraction of value, wealth from the, the rest of us around the world. And uh, there's a psychological benefit uh, for this because uh, that's why, it, you know, uh, being white is critically important. I mean, you take uh, a, a, a white person in the Appalachians that they used to talk about being so poor is psychologically uh, a fitter, generally speaking, than a rich person like Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson, rich, talented, you know, you don't find a white guy, nobody as talented and rich as Michael Jackson. But the psychological benefits of whiteness, so that he couldn't be white enough, in all his talent, all his money, uh, much of it went to transforming himself, mutilating himself so that he could be white, look like he was white. And so there's a psychological, deep and profound psychological benefit of whiteness, or there has been. Uh, for a long period of time. At different times, you see that psychological benefit challenge, the high tide of revolutionary movement in the, of the 60s, when uh, being white was a badge of shame, came to be a badge of shame. Now, I'm in the 1960s. I, I remember on one occasion when I uh, was the leader of an organization called Jomo, the Hunter Militant Organization, and I was walking through a department store uh, in, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, I was going through the store, and an old white woman ran up to me, and she said, please tell me that you don't hate me. I don't know this woman. She don't know me. Please tell me that you don't hate me. Because the revolution had gathered steam and strong, and it was generalized around the world, and white power could see its decline. And that decline was something that made itself manifest in the consciousness of ordinary white people. And... Uh, so we say that uh, there are, uh, da, 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 where am I? Said, uh, said Trump has continued to wage a fierce fight back against his colonial capitalist uh, contenders, even as his attacks on the intelligence agencies within the U.S. are causing obvious unease. For some imperialist apologists, Trump has also worked incessantly to destroy the myth of a neutral, disinterested bourgeois media working for the benefit of all the people. This is one of the good things that came from the Trump campaign and candidacy, because there were many people who actually stuck on this thing that somehow the bourgeois media, that this is, what do they call it, the fifth estate, and you know it was working for the people, it was objective, it was disinterested in the outcomes and stuff like that. It just wanted to tell the truth, just the truth, ma'am, and exposed all the contradictions. Trump said, no, nah, this is fake news. This is, you know, and, and uh, now it's become a part of the common lexicon that fake news, fake news, fake news, and, and because this myth has been destroyed, and of course the media has been, have been um, an instrument of white power, you know, uh, and most instances even, even Negro media. So Trump's term fake news has become accepted lingua Franca, even within the respected media, media platforms of the ruling class. This intra-ruling class airing of dirty laundry uh, is tarnishing uh, and undermining uh, the carefully constructed bourgeois myth of a noble white power working in the general interests of the world's peoples. The old adage that your actions speak so loudly I can't hear a word you say uh, is conspicuously applicable here. There are no good guys in this struggle, neither the Democratic nor Republican parties. Not, not the Democratic Party, distinguished uh, as the millions of, uh, disguised rather as the millions of white women who are declaring me too, but who are more than 100, but who are more than 160 years later, uh, still unable to answer the question posed by Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman too? Uh, 
not the Democratic Party disguised as thousands of high school students marching against the gun violence as long as the police murder of Africans and the U.S. murders of colonized peoples of the world are not mentioned. Uh, not the Second Amendment defenders nor the Democratic and Republican uh, protectors of the FBI who are outraged at alleged Russian intervention in quote unquote our elections, uh, the finest uh, example of democracy, unquote, as long as it does not include an African church in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, uh, where it's quite appropriate to interfere uh, in the election by bombing and murdering little black children. Uh, the reputation of the office of the U.S. presidency and the most highly respected institutions of the U.S. are being sullied beyond repair. Let me say that again. The reputation of the office of the U.S. presidency and the most highly respected institutions of the U.S. are being sullied beyond repair. Never mind that Trump is carefully successful in carrying out uh, many of the programs with an electoral base, uh, many of his programs uh, with, a, with an electoral uh, base hovering at 40% or below, or that his capitalist opponents are too cowardly to make a frontal assault on the citadel. Uh, the fact is that there are millions of people within the U.S. and abroad who, while not organized to make a meaningful fight back, are nevertheless disgusted with the U.S. The Trump regime has touted the U.S. meeting with Kim Jong-un, leader of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as a major triumph, supposed evidence that his threatening uh, and anti-Kim act antics drove the Korean leader to the negotiating table. Almost everyone, including Trump's opponents and those made uneasy by the meeting, agree that it was Kim's desperation in the face of Trump's threats that is responsible for the June 2018 uh, Singapore meeting. If there are some who cannot see through this obvious lie, it is because they are not aware that the DPRK had always called for direct negotiations with the U.S. It has been the U.S. that has refused to meet with the Korean government not the other way around. Uh, since the failure to capture all of Korea during the colonial Korean War, the policy of the U.S. has been to deny the legitimacy of the DPRK that came to power through revolution led by a Workers' Party. That's been the policy uh, since the 50s when, uh, when the uh, uh, People's Democratic uh, Republic of Korea, Democratic People's Republic of Korea was first uh, created through revolution, through struggle that was led by communist uh, Kim Il-sung. Uh, the policy has been to, that they are not legitimate and even that not to recognize their existence if it were possible. That's been the United States policy. It's not been the policy of the Korean people or the Korean government. Uh, as the undeclared uh, conclusion of the war, the U.S. began a process of pumping billions of dollars in capitalist investments into the Republic of Korea or South Korea. The U.S. wanted to show the superiority of colonial capitalism over the self-identified communist government under the authority of indigenous non-white working people. So the U.S. put all kinds of resources there. I wanted to show that, that, uh, that people who are not white, who decided to have their own government, to work in their own interests, and to be against uh, capitalism and have workers in charge of their affairs, the United States had to prove uh, to everybody that that's not the best way, that you're much better off being uh, lapdogs for U.S. And, and, and white imperialism. And so they quarantined the uh, government of uh, Kim Il-sung, who was uh, what they call North Korea, and they pumped resources into the South Korean government uh, with the objective, again, of showing how much better off you'd be if you don't uh, be too black and too militant and too working class. Thousands of U.S. troops have occupied South Korea since the end of the war, where they participate with troops from the Republic of Korea in incessant, aggressive war games, practicing the invasions 
of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The presence and role of China in the current development of U.S.-Korean relations must not be understated. China has its own interests and will doubtlessly work to advance them. There has been much uh, speculation as to whether the U.S. can threaten and bully China uh, with economic sanctions and the like. Uh, one thing that we do know is that the military intervention of Chinese troops in the Korean War prevented the U.S. from total domination of the Korean uh, Peninsula. China recognizes that the thousands of U.S. troops stationed in the Republic of Korea and other components of the aggressive military presence in the region are there as part of an outdated China containment policy of the U.S. government. It is hard to imagine China would look kindly at a U.S. assault on Korea that would open a direct military landline to China. The U.S. and Democratic People's Republic of Korea are engaged in direct talks now because the Koreans have changed the power relations in the Asian Pacific region and especially on the Korean Peninsula. Indeed, the Koreans have altered the power relations in the world. After months of publicly testing nuclear warheads despite U.S. threats, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea has demonstrated its nuclear capacity and a delivery system that can even reach the United States. All the people of Korea want the reunification of their land and their nation. All are aware that Trump's prior threats to uh, obliterate North Korea uh, would mean a threat to the existence of all of Korea, the, the South included. Most people are aware that at this point in history, uh, a U.S. attack on, North, on Korea uh, would not be a one-sided attack. Uh, and that while the North could not match the U.S. in quantity and quality of arms, they could certainly deliver a devastating military response that would involve the entire Korean uh, Peninsula and much of Asia. In other words, the U.S.-Korean meeting represents a major policy shift on the side of the U.S., not the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Therefore, if fear was a factor in making the meeting happen, it was not the fear by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Whether the immediate consequences of the meeting, whatever the immediate consequence of the meeting, one thing is certain, the world has changed considerably and it uh, will not go unnoticed by the oppressed of the world. Uh, that the U.S. is no, U.S. no longer has absolute hegemony in Asia and the world. If developing Korean muscularity can push the U.S. imperialists back, there will be a great rush by others to attain a capacity to resist U.S. imperialist terror. The advent of China, the advent of China and Korea as major players in the world is further evidence of the retreat of absolute white power that defines the world today. It was once, it was only a few years ago that the phrase, quote, not having a Chinaman's chance, unquote, reflected the anti, the semi-colonial and economically deprived status of China in the world. The fact that China is boldly uh, intruding on economic and political terrain that white nationalist imperialists uh, have previously assumed their prerogative uh, as part of the growing, uh, is part of the growing global trajectory of the oppressed to uh, push European colonialism out of our lives and out of existence. The European Union, once perceived by some as a big uh, economic, big economy a competitor to the U.S., is currently in disarray. The departure of England from the group and others threatening to do the same compounds the implication of the unremitting economic and political crisis of Greece, uh, the threat uh, to the integrity of Spain's presumed national identity, and the Euro-skeptic uh, uh, government uh, that has come uh, to power in Italy. War continues to undermine the stability of the Middle East. 
Yemen, an ally of Iran, strategically located at the mouth of the Red Sea shipping lane, uh, has endured ruthless slaughter and starvation by its of its population by a U.S.-Israeli supported war by Saudi Arabia. The voluntary self-censorship of U.S. and European media serves as a function of the war. And, and you know, while we say that the, the, the talking about the um, uh, U.S. military, uh, U.S. Israeli supported war uh, by Saudi Arabia. That's that's not exactly accurate, because Saudi Arabia itself was created by European imperialism, especially the French uh, and the British, and it is an arm and has always been a military outpost of the U.S. government along with Israel. These are military outposts of the United States government. These are forces that th these are self-serving, obviously. Uh, uh, neo-colonial forces, but uh, they're, they're conscious of their own interests, uh, but their strategic aims of the United States is what guides what they do, and not just the strategic aims. They, the U.S. actually puts uh, personnel, uh, military forces, uh, and personnel who knows how to use them, uh, the technology and what have you. These, this is the war that's been made against Yemen, and part of this is an attack on Iran. Uh, the inf growing influence of Iran that uh, increasingly is becoming a power in that region uh, and, and uh, would challenge the U.S. hegemony, like China is challenging the U.S. hegemony uh, in, in much of Asia and even Africa now, Iran challenging U.S. hegemony uh, in the so-called Middle East. Uh, these are real threats to the status quo that we've talked about earlier. And Israel is a, as, has all, long been uh, a military outpost, a state of Israel, an illegitimate white nationalist state of Israel. Uh, and now you have the state of the Saudi government and there are others like that. And uh, uh, so that's what we're looking at. So we say uh, the advent of China and Korea as major players in the world is further evidence of the retreat uh, of, of absolute or white power and define, that defines the world today. It was only a few years ago uh, that we talked about not having a Chinaman's chance. So uh, let's see, where are we? Okay, so on page 133, uh, the first full paragraph, the U.S. war uh, that destroyed uh, the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein has resulted in the growing influence of Iran in that region. The U.S., Israel, uh, and, Saudi, and Saudi Arabia have combined to combat Iran in a, in a variety of ways that include the war against Yemen <clears throat> and the economic quarantine of Iran. They've also done things like kidnapping Iranian uh, scientists. They have uh, used uh, 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 viruses that they've created to uh, affect the ability of the Iranian people to develop their nuclear capacity. They have uh, actually uh, done sabotage, physical sabotage, bombings and stuff like that in Iran. None of this goes reported and what have you, but they've been making war against Iran for a while now to try and prevent Iran uh, from, from exercising the influence that it has achieved. Uh, so after five years, the U.S. initiated war against Syria uh, that stemmed from the uh, counterinsurgent intent to overthrow the regime of Bashar al-Assad continues to be fraught with a major potential for imperialist world war. Under Trump, the U.S. and Israel have attacked Syria to target Syrian allied Iranian troops, also a risk in military confrontation with Russian troops deployed in Syria. Contributing to the crisis of imperialism is the fact that China has initiated a major economic project designed to further challenge the uh, Atlanticist uh, arrangement. The $100 billion Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, created by uh, the Xi uh, Jinping uh, administration, that's China, already has uh, commitments from at least 21 Asian countries. It's more than that by now. Australia, Indonesia, and South Korea uh, were noticeably absent from the, dual, from the deal after severe pressure from the United States. And part of what's happening is U.S. currency the dollar is the dominant currency of the world. It is the major trade currency. All the entire banking system of the world is organized, revolves around the U.S. dollar. Well, work has been going on for a while now uh, to change that. 
Uh, Hugo Chavez was a part of an effort uh, to deal with that. One of the reasons they attacked him, uh, the Syrian government under uh, Gaddafi was a part of that. Uh, China is a major force in dealing with that. Russia, major force in dealing with that. Uh, you see how all of these uh, quarantines that they initiate they, uh, against these uh, peoples uh, uh, and governments in, around the world. Uh, I forgot the characterization that they used to, uh, to prevent people from trading with them, uh, sanctions. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of countries disagree with that, and so they're finding ways uh, to get around that. And even some European countries, so-called Western European countries, uh, participating with these other avenues. Uh, so the one major objective for many of the, several of the countries around the world uh, is to break the U.S. stranglehold, the stranglehold uh, on the world economy that's now uh, being uh, held uh, by the United States government and has been in place uh, actually uh, since the 1940s. Uh, after the Second Imperialist World War, when they created the International Monetary Fund, when they created the World Bank and things like that, and the whole banking system, the majority, is centered on the U.S. dollar, headquartered in the United States, and this is one of the struggles that's happening with other peoples. And Trump, Trump's uh, trade wars and all these attacks and sanctions on different countries is aggravating that situation and pushing more countries like Russia and like China, like others, into uh, looking into means of getting around the U.S. dollar uh, and U.S. banking system. Many of the members of the, uh, the uh, AIIB, which is the, uh, the new uh, entity that's created by China, uh, are countries uh, of the Chinese-led Belt and Road Initiative. These major Chinese economic projects that necessarily encroach on the heretofore domination of the world by Euro-American Euro capital contribute to the overall crisis of imperialism. At the same time, other countries find themselves looking for options outside the Atlanticist sphere of control. Even the ongoing scandal in South African politics involving former president and African National Congress ANC leader Jacob Zuma revolves around changes of, uh, charges of corruption conveniently leveled at Zuma by equally corrupt officials opposed to his apparent coziness with Indian and possibly Chinese capital, definitely Chinese capital. In Africa, at least one government has been overthrown in, by France because of an attempt uh, to initiate a new deal with China that would uh, free Ivory Coast from the clutches of historical French colonialism. Hugo Chavez of Venezuela uh, and Muammar Gaddafi of Libya are two of the leaders who were undermined and or killed because of attempts made to escape domination of the U.S. military-backed dollar, uh, still the leading world economy, currency rather. Imperialism continues to exist. Colonial capitalism continues to be the dominant social system on earth. However, there, are, there is an uneasy equilibrium where the struggle of the oppressed and colonized peoples of the world calls into question everything that shaped the political and economic features of the world. This crisis has reached its tipping point. Uh, the crisis of imperialism is characterized by extraordinary volatility that is also reflected in the politic and consciousness of the people of the world. Europeans and especially so-called Americans are experiencing distress. The growing alcoholism, drug addiction, suicides, mass killings, and a host of social afflictions uh, and diseases of despair have caused an unusual spike uh, in the death rate of white people, especially middle-aged white men in the United States. On the other hand, this volatility, volatility is represented by growing struggles of colonized peoples, boldly challenging their relationship to imperialist white power. This is happening globally and within the U.S. among Africans in the imperialist center. The imperialists are struggling to find their place during this crisis. All kinds of new possibilities are opening up for our revolution. Central to all our possibilities is the growth of the organization, capacity, and influence of our party. The key resource available to our forcibly dispersed African nation. Central 
to all our possibilities is the growth of the organization, capacity, and influence of our party, the key resource available to our forcibly dispersed, colonized nation. New alliances will also present themselves to our struggle as the old alliances among the imperialists are dying and or reorganizing themselves. In the past, when certain fissures emerged within the imperialist camp, our movement was able uh, to form important relationships with the governments of Cuba and Algeria and Congo Brazzaville, among others. Vietnam and China also played a key support role to anti-colonial freedom fighters. Even some bourgeois nationalist governments in Africa and the Middle East were willing to leverage their power by aiding the struggle of Africans in the U.S. And, thro and throughout Africa during an era when the Soviet Union also represented a counterbalance to U.S. power. As the balance of power continues to shift and the crisis deepens, the coming years will begin to light the uh, to light the possibility of new allies and alliances, I'm sorry, as the balance of power continues to shift and the crisis deepens, the coming years will bring to light the possibility of new allies and alliances uh, which embrace the African anti-colonial struggle. There are some liberals who would have us engaged in an unrelenting fight against fascism, fascism as they call it. Um, uh, that they see in the utterings and actions of uh, Trump. However, we never forget that we are colonized. And the democratic colonialism is still colonialism. The fascism feared by whites and liberals look very much like the colonialism Africans have experienced in this country for centuries. Europeans are accustomed to the experience of bourgeois democracy, which hides the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. For colonized people, the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie is raw and obvious all the time through the violence of the state and the general white population, as well as the arbitrary denial of the civil and democratic rights of the colonized. What Europeans call fascism is the point when the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie experienced all the time by Africans and other colonized peoples challenges the veneer of bourgeois democracy enjoyed by white people. Let's <coughs> say that again. Say so what Europeans call fascism is the point when the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie experienced all the time by Africans and other colonized people challenges the veneer of bourgeois democracy enjoyed by white people. And I, I want to just comment on that. I mean, you look at... Um, you know, the French, you know, who fighting against fascism, against the German Nazis and what have you, while at the same time killing people in Vietnam. The French are fighting against fascism uh, while at the same time uh, crushing our people and occupying uh, Algeria. Uh, uh, the U.S. fighting against uh, uh, the German fascists uh, in Germany uh, while lynching was the national pastime of black people in the United States, uh, where segregation uh, as, uh, was so hated uh, by Africans, uh, et cetera. And even uh, the Communist Party uh, of the U.S. at the time uh, that would organize uh, uh, Africans and others to go fight against Spanish, uh, Spanish fascism, uh, the fascism that brought Franco to power uh, in the 1930s. Uh, recruited African people who went and fought the fascists. Uh, and this is the 1930s, where Africans were being lynched uh, you know, in droves uh, throughout the United States. Here we are fighting against fascism uh, in Spain, as they characterized it. So uh, the liberals would have us turn our backs on the liberation of our people and the colonized peoples of the world to come to the rescue of liberal <laughs> democratic colonialism. And that's what you were talking about. The best thing that happens, I mean, so Germany lost the war. Fascism was defeated. Uh, this is uh, uh, in the 1940s. And then look what's happening to African people in the 40s. Lynching was still a national pastime in this country. Uh, and look at what's happening uh, with colonized, even today. Uh, France controls something like 14 uh, uh, so-called countries uh, on the continent of Africa. Democratic 
free France, you know. Um, uh, so uh, the struggle against fascism serves a sector of the white ruling class and colonial society, but for African people, it only maintains our self-defeating fight uh, to, make white, to, to make white people like us and to stop the police from killing and imprisoning us. So uh, it's a fake struggle. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really a diversion from overturning the social system. So here you have uh, sectors of the bourgeoisie that are fighting against uh, Trump. And you hear even sectors of the bourgeoisie and some of the leading bourgeois publications uh, uh, speculating about fascism in the form of Donald Trump. And yes, they want Trump gone. And yes, Trump uh, represents to them the worst thing that's ever happened. Uh, but Trump is just an expression of, of, uh, of the colonial power uh, that dominates African peoples around the world. That's what it is. And what we're saying is that you can fight Trump and the next Trump and the next Trump and the next Trump because the function of the bourgeois system is to reproduce Trumps all the time. So it reproduces itself. So the thing that has to happen is the system has to be destroyed. Our relationship to the system has to be destroyed. And what, people, what happens is, just like you've got a Democrat and a Republican Party here, and you've got the Tories and, and the, Social, and the uh, Socialist Party in England, and you've got different varieties all around the world, uh, you end up uniting with one sector of white power against the other sector of white power, as opposed to uniting against white power to overturn the entire system, the entire relationship, destroy white power, destroy the system that produces white power. Republicans or Democrats, male, female, homosexual, heterosexual, uh, trans, doesn't matter. Uh, that system has to go. And that has to be our focus. That has to be the strategic objective of revolutionary activity uh, by African, African nation. That's the struggle that the African People's Socialist Party with the advanced uh, uh, theory of African internationalism is leading. And that's one of the distinguishing things about our party. So we say, uh, the struggle against fascism is in many ways similar to the fight against racism in that it is a struggle to find a safe place within colonialism. It is a struggle that protects the colonial capitalist relationship that we have with imperialist white power. It is a struggle that unites us with one sector of colonial power against another. And it does absolutely nothing to destroy colonialism. And the, the Vietnamese fought against French colonialism. And the France were fighting against fascism. And then French used colonial, France used colonial subjects from Algeria, from other parts of Africa and other places. These are colonial subjects. These are people who are living under direct colonial white power of the French, of French. French fighting against fascism, then French recruits and requires, drafts and put into military action other colonized people who fought against the Vietnamese who were colonized by France who was fighting against fascism. Who were fighting against fascism. So here they're supposedly fighting against fascism and 71% of their military force, of French's, France's military force, while fighting that was that uh, while fighting against Vietnam, 71% of France's military force uh, were colonized people. So you got an anti fascist France having colonial domination of all these African and, and other people who they used to fight against other colonized people, the Vietnamese. And you're telling me my struggle is against fascism? The French fought fascism. The U.S. fought fascism. The Belgians fought fascism. And all of them uh, played a, criminal, a horrible role of uh, oppressing a colonial domination of Africa, the African world, and other peoples around the world. <coughs> this is reminiscent of the now deceased activist and poet, Amiri Baraka, <coughs> when he expressed concern in 2008 uh, that African and or left Refusal to support Obama's election would open the door to fascism in a way similar uh, to the rise of Hitler in Germany during the 1930s. This is, this is Emir Baraka's ridiculous position. Uh, first of all, many Africans uh, have recognized over the years that what happened to European Jews 
at the hands of Nazi Germany follows on the heels of an accepted, normalized practice of genocide against African, indigenous, Arab, and Asian people for hundreds of years by Europeans in the process of imposing slavery and colonialism on the majority of humanity, the process of building parasitic capitalism. I'm going to read this again. First of all, many Africans uh, have recognized over the years that what happened to European Jews at the hands of Nazi Germany follows on the heels of an accepted, normalized practice of genocide against Africans, indigenous, Arab, and Asian peoples for hundreds of years by Europeans in the process of imposing slavery and colonialism on the majority of humanity, the process of building parasitic capitalism itself. The tendency uh, to compare our situation with fascism in Nazi Germany and elsewhere is erroneous and outrageous when considering the murder, terror, torture, and exploitation that Africans have endured at the hands of our white democratic colonizers for the past 600 years. It is worth noting that with all the terror and brutality Africans have faced since our introduction to European democracy, it took the emergence of Mussolini and Hitler and the attack on the rights of white people for a special designation called fascism to suddenly become necessary. I'm going to read that again. It's worth noting that with all the terror and brutality Africans have faced since our introduction to European democracy, it took the emergence of Mussolini and Hitler and, his, and the attack on the rights of white people for a special designation called fascism to suddenly become necessary. And I think it's really important to make this point because now we hear some Africans who face with the reality that we pushed on them that fascism pre-existed, uh, pre was there much earlier than, uh, that, 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 that colonialism was there much earlier uh, than fascism and that uh, colonialism that Africans experience, uh, that the fascism has never produced, what they call fascism, never produced anything equal to it and that, that democratic uh, uh, colonialism uh, is as bad as fascist colonialism. Colonialism is colonialism. And so what now uh, to sort of uh, having run into that and then they say, well, that, that fascism, we, we experienced fascism first, you know, like, like uh, black people, well, there was no fascism. What happened was we experienced the emergence of capitalism, and capitalism came through colonial domination, not, not some other way around. And we, we experienced the consequences and the messes of people, the majority of the people, people in Yemen are not fighting against fascism. It doesn't matter whether you, it's, it's a colonial occupation that that Europe uh, continues to maintain or uh, de is determined to maintain. The people in Venezuela are not fighting against fascism, it's democratic capitalism that they are fighting against there in Venezuela and uh, attempt, attempt and intent to reimpose uh, some form of colonial domination on those people. That's the reality that we are confronted with. And you run around f fighting against fascism, uh, which means that as opposed to Trump dominating Venezuela, now we want uh, uh, Obama or we want Clinton or we want uh, uh, Beto, whatever his name is, or we want uh, the Kamala Harris or, or some uh, Bernie to be a, the dominant force. So you got a democratic colonialism. And we're saying that the colonial question is the fundamental question in the world today and has been. It gave birth to capitalism. It gave uh, uh, fascism uh, as an expression of capitalism uh, had to come after the emergence of colonialism. All of this rests upon the foundation of colonial uh, uh, terror, uh, value extraction of African and other peoples around the world. Uh, so, <coughs> I'm just gonna, uh, well, what I'm gonna do <laughs> is call on you uh, to really study uh, this chapter. I think it's really important. I don't think you can understand uh, what's happening today uh, without uh, 
grappling, well, first of all, with the entire political report, but certainly this chapter we talk about the, uh, the deepening crisis of imperialism because it is deepening uh, every day. Um, I have a, uh, a statement here uh, with, on page 139. Uh, I'm skipping over a really important um, piece that was done uh, by uh, Amy uh, Cesar, who uh, was uh, from Martinique. He was based in Martinique, and uh, he was the mentor to Franz Fanon, and it's something he wrote in 1955, which is on page 137. You should look at that. And it reads uh, from 137 through 138, and then on page 139, um, uh, you know, we have a statement here that uh, when quote unquote proto fascist repression uh, did appear in the U.S., uh, uh, the, in the 1950s is, was what is called the, uh, in the U.S., uh, the 1950s in what uh, is called the McCarthy era with the reign of terror backed by popular support from the general white population chasing the Communist Party underground and almost into extinction. It was the colonized African population whose struggle for democracy kept the society open in the United States. I mean, uh, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, and an army of Africans living near starvation and suffering every imaginable deprivation were the, one, were the forces that not only defeated U.S. fascism, but forged new definitions of democracy onto the agenda of the U.S. This is a time they're fighting against fascism where Africans are hanging from trees in this country and are being bound and torched to death. And some instances I've read of African men who were being slowly murdered, uh, burned uh, with the genitals uh, actually being cut off while they're alive and then being forced to eat them. And I'm supposed to be fighting against fascism? They didn't call that fascism. It's never been characterized as fascism. They would do it belatedly now to try to get in front of the question so that we cannot uh, locate uh, the essence of our own oppression and exploitation. But they didn't call that fascism. And so they could only get upset when something was happening to white people, when they're, they're torturing African men, cutting off their genitals and forcing them to eat it while they're still alive, and I'm fighting against fascism. That was democratic colonialism that did that. See, Africans would still be on plantations, buck dancing for a slimy, non-fascist, democratic, white nationalist social system. And every white person who so demanded uh, had those aforementioned Africans tremble from the fear of fascism. The designer character of the term is even more obvious when we search for a definition of fascism. While there are many, including some identified as scientific or Marxist, it is clear that there is not a satisfactory a priori definition. That is to say, what it is before it happens. You understand, like a priori, to define something, you, it's not like you gotta see it before it happens. That's how some Africans trick us today because they don't want us to be able to identify the class question, even among ourselves. So they don't want to say African petty bourgeoisie. They don't want us to identify that social force, so they say it's an Uncle Tom. Well, who is an Uncle Tom? You don't know who an Uncle Tom is until, it, until he does something Uncle Tomish. Or they say it's the uh, misleadership class. What in the hell is that? You don't know who that is until they mislead. You understand? But there is a social force with an objective interest in maintaining the status quo. And sometimes people will act like Uncle Tom's and it's not their objective interest to do so, but they do it. If you don't know what the objective interest is, then you cannot reform, transform that person because they're acting, because when every, almost every African opens her mouth, it's the bourgeoisie that's speaking through it. It's the petty bourgeoisie that's speaking through their mouths when they talk. So there's an objective interest that's held by the petty bourgeoisie. That's a class force. 
we have to identify that class force so that that class force, even when it's talking militant talk, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to use that example, even when it's talking militant talk, uh, is, has as an objective interest the maintenance of the same social system. Even when they say, when a, when a class force, when a force tells you that I'm a socialist because I believe that a worker should get $15 an hour over a number of years, that's, a, that's the petty bourgeoisie or the bourgeoisie talking to you. Because socialism is where the working class takes control of the whole system the means of production owned and controlled by the workers. It is the workers who become the state in arms. It's the workers in arms that become the state. This force who is telling you about over a number of years you won't become, get $15 an hour when you produce every damn thing that the, bourgeois, that the ones who are paying you $15 an hour get, that's no, that's no socialism. But it's, uh, it becomes a substitute for revolutionary revolutionary uh, 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 attack, and it's it used to uh, disguise and obscure class contradictions uh, because there is a social force that has to come to power for socialism to exist. Not only is there a social force that has to come to power for socialism to exist, it can only come uh, to power through overturning capitalism. It's got to have a revolution. You can't wish it into existence. You can't say nice phrases and then it will go away. It's not like wistful thinking. You got to do something to get rid of it. That's another story. So we say that fascism has become a pejorative, uh, sometimes something that defines some traits of the phenomena once it appears. But fascism is incapable of being defined scientifically in a way that would help us to know it before it arrives. Uh, it is notable that the ubiquitous murder uh, imprisonment and police containment of the African population is never defined as fascism. These conditions are seen by the white population as normal. And even the African petty bourgeois militants, that's normal. Even people who you work with every day who will jump in a demonstration in a minute to fight against fascism does not consider fascism murdering 18-year-old Tyrone, I mean, uh, 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 Mike Brown in broad daylight, gunning him down and leaving his body there for four and a half hours in August heat uh, in St. Louis of uh, Ferguson. That's not fascism. Fascism is something where the whole white people and everybody uh, 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 are threatened, but it's not something that happens on a normal basis every day to African people. They, it's an attempt, whether intended or not, uh, to obscure class contradiction. And we say the class contradiction in the real world is concentrated where? In the colonial question. It is only when the features of the normal existence of the colonized begin to intrude into the existence of whites or the larger quote-unquote society, the term fascism comes into play. At that point, the colonized are called on to choose between fascist colonialism and non-fascist democratic colonialism. Anyway, that's all I'm going to read for now. There's a quote here from Cabral uh, following this, but I want to leave some time uh, for discussion. I hope I left some time, and I, uh, I really hope that people will read this, and I'm hoping that the discussion that we have now makes it uh, less challenging to be able to read it, and people could, we could have uh, uh, inspired some kind of excitement about uh, the ideas that's being addressed and uh, the analysis that's being put forward. Uhuru. Uhuru, let's salute our leadership, Chairman Amalia Chitello, for that brilliant study. Uhuru, and we just want to appreciate everybody who is watching on the live, tuning in either on Facebook or YouTube. Please continue to watch, share, and invite your friends and family to this very important study. Um, right now we have, or we know, that there are people who have been watching from Detroit, Tampa, Florida, St. Petersburg, Florida, Miami, Florida, Fort Myers, Orlando, Richmond, Virginia, St. Louis, Missouri, Houston, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, Springfield, Illinois, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Portland, Oregon, Spokane, Washington, Buffalo, New York, and London. So hooroo to all of our viewers all around the world. And we have a comment from uh, Comrade Nana Yal Grant, who is a Northern Regional Representative of the African People's Socialist Party, says death to colonialism, imperialism, and parasitic capitalism. And Ikemba in Philadelphia says, this study is speaking to the importance of the oppressed defining phenomena, which is made plain and simple, simple through the theory of African internationalism. He also asks, Chairman, 
Is China's presence in Africa an attempt to replace European hegemony with Chinese hegemony? Do these pose a threat to African internationalism, or, are, or should they be seen as allies in our fight for the liberation of Africa? China doesn't uh, see, China sees itself as going for its own interests. It doesn't, it's not, I mean, replacing uh, European imperialism, I mean, that's uh, 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 something that is a consequence of what China is doing, and China obviously has to be aware and, uh, of that. But its objective is to realize the interests of uh, China uh, as uh, being uh, uh, identified uh, by the Chinese Communist Party, which functions, uh, uh, which is a name that the bourgeoisie in China now gives itself. Uh, 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 so that's China is working in its own interest, and it, whether it's a threat to African internationalism. Uh, the, the African internationalism, all uh, extraction of value, or the whole occupation of Africa by any force that is there for the purpose of extracting value uh, is a threat to the existence of Africa and African people. Uh, China, is, as I mentioned, Africa is being gentrified. It's hard to go any place in Africa today. I don't care the remotest village without finding Chinese there. Not only is China extracting value, uh, but uh, many Chinese people, China is also uh, exporting um, part of uh, a huge population uh, that it has uh, into China as well. Uh, it's everywhere. And so Chinese uh, uh, goods are replacing uh, what used to be considered uh, African products and things like that. Even that was, generally speaking, uh, it wasn't African product. It was some uh, European product that's cast itself off as African, uh, like most of the dashikis and things like that we wear, uh, as, uh, which were made in Holland. And uh, we protest because now when you go and get something, the same looking thing comes from China and say that China's replacing Africa. No, it was, it, was, it was never yours. And the thing is that we have to take it all back uh, that's what it is. In terms of whether or not uh, we should see China as a friend of the revolution, what we see is contradictions uh, between imperialist powers. Uh, the China's presence there has uh, uh, contributed to the weakening hold that, uh, that the U.S. or France or somebody, uh, it challenges their hold. Uh, and it creates an element of instability there that African internationalist forces have to take advantage of. Uh, and penetrate, and yes, we would. Uh, that's what our objective is. So uh, it's not our friend; it's just there. And our uh, friend is African internationalist and Af African internationalism, and the organization that we place on the ground that can take advantage of every contradiction that's there, including the presence of and activity of China. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. So there's a question from um, Morty in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm trying to phrase this in a way so. Um, it says, because it kind of split it up in a little, a little bit, but it says, how does this change the revolutionary historical perspective on white women as some kind of bystander to white men as the dominant oppressor? As some kind of what? Dominant oppressor. No, as some kind of by oh, what? bystander to white oh, men. Oh, as looking mm -hmm. uh, uh, to white men as the dominant uh, um, how does this change the revolutionary mm -hmm. historical perspective on white women as some kind of bystander to white men as the dominant oppressor? Okay, I don't know about a revolutionary historical perspective that, that, uh, that holds that position. Uh, there has been an interesting uh, kind of contradiction because uh, there are social contradictions that exist in the white world. Uh, like what we say is the primary contradiction in the world uh, is that existing between oppressed and oppressor nations. Uh, which is not to say that the oppressed uh, nations uh, uh, have uh, always have the same interests. We've identified even among the oppressed nation, there are class questions. And, uh, there are, uh, and in, among the oppressed nation, uh, women uh, are misused and what have you. Uh, and among the oppressor nation, uh, you see contradictions existing between uh, uh, homosexual and heterosexual and uh, women and men, et cetera. Uh, uh, but the point is that each of the contradictions that I just mentioned require uh, for its existence the fundamental, the main contradiction, which is the relationship between the oppressor nation and the oppressed nation. So what has to happen is the target has to be the, this main contradiction. And whomever can unite with attacking the main contradiction is on the right side. But what happens is that Ultimately, usually white women are put forth as having contradictions 
and then that, and they call often in the form of feminism, call on African women because we're all sisters to fight against the same thing. Uh, but you're not targeting the main contradiction, which means colonialism continues to exist. And how can a white woman uh, be a sister to an African woman uh, if the white woman is not fighting against the domination of black people? Because if you're not fighting against the domination of African people, at the end of the day, since African women are African people, they will always be oppressed, even fighting against feminism. So the question for us is which contradiction we're we trying to resolve. Some people, because of, of how this works, especially in places like the United States and perhaps in England, uh, et cetera, will uh, move to get, try to find personal solution to this social contradiction. The personal solution is the easy out. So you have a personal solution, uh, uh, what they call uh, interracial this and interracial that. It is a substitute. Uh, and I'm not talking about how people emote and whether you have emotions about this person or that person. It becomes a substitute for overturning the system that's responsible. You get your own personal solution with your personal person, right, as opposed to overturning the social system. And so uh, if a white woman, white man, white uh, uh, lesbian, white uh, 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 homosexual, white, trans, and whatever, can unite in the struggle against colonialism, which is the primary dominant contradiction we are confronted with, right on. And they do that under the leadership of the African working class because the colonized, the colonial question, the relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor nation is the main contradiction around which all the others revolve. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. I really appreciate that answer. Um, especially because, like, right now, we even see in this whole question of you know like the struggles that are happening with oppressed peoples around the world and how white women even jump in front of those to be able to you know gain access to rights for themselves at well, the expense of african right. right yeah um like including like with this huge even like the big question right now for white women is another form of how they're gonna keep access of another form of birth control called abortion yeah. Yeah. so yeah. um which is a whole another and there's Trouble a form of birth women. control already in existence that calls prison right. for Africans and other people like that. That's one aspect in police killings and, uh, you know, right on. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to get to this question. Uh, Karma Nana Yaw asks, how are we going to force the imperialist U.S. military force, force bases on the African continent to get out of Africa? We're going to fight them there. <laughs> We're going to fight them. And the U.S. knows that's what's going to happen. That's why they trap all these young Africans uh, who are born of some Somali-born uh, parents, uh, particularly, uh, where, is, where is that? They, 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 they trap them. They entrap them. They say, you know, you can go to Somalia, and you can fight the Americans. And when they say, yeah, I want to go, then they put them in prison and stuff like that for supporting terrorism, et cetera. We're going to fight them. We're going to fight them in Africa. And that's the only thing. We're going to overturn all of the colonial... Uh, uh, petty bourgeois neo-colonial forces that that's the only way Africa is ever going to be free. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to fight them there. Right. And part of that struggle is removing these, these neo-colonial impediments. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Ngon Ah in Tampa, Florida, um, viewing on YouTube, asked her chairman, what are your thoughts on the LGBTQ weaponized sexual attack on Kenya and Azania? D. I'm not sure I understand the weaponized sexual um, attack on Kenya and Zambia. I do know <coughs> uh, that in, in Africa, in certain places, uh, we have these neocolonial puppet regimes that don't give a damn about white power strangling Africa, stealing our resources and doing everything, but who are attacking and killing people uh, because they're homosexuals. And that somehow, uh, which is uh, simply an attack on a sector of the oppressed, colonized African nation and working class. So they say all of that, they say homosexuals are anti-African, and this is, this is uh, not uh, part of our tradition, like imperialism is, like white power is. And I don't see any of those, uh, those leaders that are talking about killing and jailing homosexuals, talking about killing or jailing any of those white people who are strangling and taking everything right there in Africa. A white person uh, can go to Africa and can, without a visa uh, and just enter our, uh, you know, the, almost every place in Africa where uh, you can't get an African out of Africa, heterosexual, homosexual, trans, or anything, uh, ordinary African uh, from Africa into the United States. So uh, I just think most of it's bogus, it's BS to, to, to 
that we're looking at. It's got nothing to do with African culture. African culture is a culture of resisting uh, uh, the kind of uh, terror uh, that colonialism is imposing on us every place. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uh, thank you. And I, the common. Weaponized colonialism. Weaponized yeah. neo colonialism. Weaponized, uh, uh, you know, bug dancing, boot uh, kissing, and other things that they kiss. Uh, uh, who have been put in power to keep our people locked in the death grip of imperialism. That's the weapon that, yeah. Um, so someone, uh, Richard Souffron in Orlando commented, um, as you stated in your example, asking for $15 an hour is defined as socialism by whites. But in reality, this is like a slave asking for more benefits. It does nothing to disrupt the system. Mm -hmm. um, That's like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, we get a $15 hour a raise after, I mean, we come here working for nothing, and so, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years later, we get a $15 raise. That's the best we can ask for <laughs> as enslaved people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, Morty from Richmond, Virginia asks, why is the African petty bourgeoisie able to so effectively maintain its influence? Because we have been, uh, because they collaborated with the imperialists. Uh, especially in the 1960s when the black revolution was defeated. They acted as cover uh, for imperialism. And that goes as far as uh, the people like the, the Democratic Party hacks. It goes as far as people like Obama, uh, et cetera, who seduce uh, our people. And because they could do that only after killing Panthers, only after killing revolutionaries like uh, from Jomo and jailing people all around uh, this country and around the world. All over Africa, the same thing is happening. That's why. That's why it's so important to join the African People's Socialist Party to become an African internationalist uh, engaged in and taking the power on every, every block, every corner uh, throughout this country and around the world. African internationalists organized uh, into the African People's Socialist Party uh, have to be mobilized. That gets the petty bourgeoisie out of the way. Uhuru. And to that, um, Comrade Tachara Masimba in St. Louis, Missouri asks, can you speak to the notion that the way to attack colonialism is to put, quote unquote, conscious Africans in various places within the state to act in the interests of the African nation? Well, conscious Africans in various places in the state. Uh, yeah, that's a, a concept. And it's also, again, uh, something that is uh, used to uh, obscure the, the class question and even the colonial question. To have a conscious African pushing the button to drop the bomb as opposed to one that's not conscious. If you've got a social system, a structure that has structures that's designed to drop bombs, and then you say, well, what are we going to do as opposed to overturning the bombing system, uh, destroying that, is put an, a conscious African in place to drop the bomb. If that conscious African is going there uh, under the leadership and authority of a revolutionary organization, revolutionary party, uh, to, to kill the bomb killers. Like, like you've seen that happen in, in Afghanistan. They keep saying that the people who are supposed to be working for the United States government, every now and then they get up and shoot every American uh, that's in, in uniform that's occupying their country. That's not what these people are talking about when they talk about having conscious Africans. And what do you mean by conscious? Do you mean that they're not comatose? Do you mean that, uh, you know, I mean, what is a conscious African? If it's not revolutionary, if it's not an African internationalist, if it's not uh, an African that's organized to destroy, destroy the social system and under the leadership of the organization to do that, it's just another Negro got a job killing us. Real. Well, that's um, all we see for questions right now. And that might be all the time we have before the announcements. I don't know. Um, yeah, we got, unless there's anything in the room. Good. Is there anything in the room? No. Nope. We're all good? Right. So we're good to go, Chairman. All Do right. you have any final words that we go into? I just want to really um, express everybody who participated in the study. And, and again, you know, the objective here is not just to explain the world, but to change it. And what we're doing now is uh, we're initiating, uh, we're participating in a process to arm uh, all uh, the forces uh, under our leadership and win as many other forces to come under our leadership for the purpose of taking power. If you're not talking about power, you're just lollygag and you doesn't you know, make any difference what it is that you have to say. You might as well be uh, investing in an imaginary university someplace. Uh, the question here is to take the power and that we have a responsibility to take power. And to do anything less than that is to leave, uh, consciously uh, determined to leave uh, the future uh, of our people, our children, uh, into the hands of these thugs who've controlled us for the last 600 years. So, Uhuru. Uhuru. We really want to appreciate you, Chairman, for taking this time.
time to, you know, teach everyone who's watching this right now and for everybody who's going to come onto this and watch this and gain some very important information and not just to take all this in, but to actually be activated to do something. And we want to appreciate everybody who participated in this study, who asked questions, and for anybody who didn't get a question answered, we do have our moderators in there who will make sure that the chairman sees your question. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For Revolutionary Radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune into Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPUhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Join the Freedom Mass Choir and Band. The Freedom Mass Choir and Band is an all-African community group of singers and instrumentalists that sing songs of resistance and revolution. Members are located throughout the United States and attend rehearsals both in person and via live stream and video. Sign up by emailing blackpowerchoir at gmail.com or call 727-537-6736. Order your copy of Chairman Amali Eshetela's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, The Political Report to the Seventh Congress at burningspermarketplace.com. It's what we were studying from today. Were you moved by Chairman's presentation this morning? You can bring this electrifying presentation to your school, campus, bookstore, concert hall, and more. To book Chairman Amalia Shetela for the Vanguard 2019 International Speaking Tour, contact Uhuru Tours at info at or call 727 727-914-3621. Sign up for the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise. The Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise is the annual fundraiser held to support the work of the African Socialist International. The African Socialist International is an organization made up of African people located virtually on every continent dedicated to overturning the conditions faced by African people worldwide. This year's cruise will be taking place from December 14th to the 19th, 2019, and will be sailing on the Carnival Sunrise from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We'll be staying overnight in Havana, Cuba, and visiting Nassau, Bahamas. Registration is now open, and deposits can be made by calling the travel agent, Linda Stern, at 732-972-4171. Where will we be staying overnight? Havana, Cuba. So, you know, you definitely want to get be on this cruise, because especially you don't know what the U.S. is going to do in terms of being able to get to uh, Cuba in the future. So. If you want to further support the ASI and the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise, make a donation by visiting ahurulegacycruise.org. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. Uhuru.